Hello, fourth grade scientists. Um, thank you so much for watching our videos, and we appreciate it. We got tons and tons of questions that we're super excited to answer. My name is Too Tall Tom. Um, this is Justin over here. Um, these are awesome questions. So what we want to cool. do is we're going to run through all three different ecosystems. We've got pages and pages of questions to go through. We're not going to be able to answer them all, but there's a lot of really good themes. A lot of you had similar questions. So what we can do is we can go through all of these. We'll pick out some of the, the ones that were most common and maybe even we'll shout you out if it was your question. Um, so right now in this video first, we're going to start with the forest ecosystem and the other videos will go ecosystem by ecosystem and try to answer as many questions as we can. And remember, if your question doesn't get answered, it doesn't mean that uh, we couldn't get to it. We'll even get to it on the actual forms too, and we can write some of those in as well. And if you have more questions, obviously, just ask. We'll be happy to answer them. So Justin's going to take the first few questions specifically for the forest ecosystem. Justin, take it away. Yes, I have a few here. Um, let's see. Let's go with... How do tr uh, this is from Michaela from Daranowski. How do trees, especially skinny ones, survive in some of the worst weather uh, weather possible, um, like tornadoes or heavy winds, that sort of thing? So yes, some of our trees that you guys can see out here aren't that big. Some of them are small. So like a little one, maybe like this right guy right here. How does it survive in strong winds? Well, I think the roots are pretty strong on these trees that you can't see. That's number one, and number two. The smaller trees, for me, when the wind is blowing, it's not catching as much. Think about if you're standing outside yourself, you know, you're not as tall and as, as obviously these big trees. So that, that would be my thought. Tom, do you have any other thoughts on that one? No, that was, that was great, Just. Awesome. Keep, I'll keep going. We do a couple uh, more. Yep. Let's see. A lot of questions, Tom, on ash trees. Sure. Okay. So I'm trying to find the specific one. Uh, let me find it. But there was questions that like, why don't I have ash trees in my backyard? Um, how come you guys have them here and other places don't have ash trees? Why are ash trees di uh, dying at YMCA Camp Sloper? Which I thought was a great question. And... We have a special guest to help answer that question. Mr. Duffy's gonna come in and he's gonna explain. We did show you guys a couple of our ash trees and um, and they are, like I said, they are dying. And Mr. Duffy's gonna tell us why. So most of the trees. Hey all fourth graders, um, good to see you. We have a lot of trees on the ground out here at Camp Sloper. And most of the trees that are down are ash trees. And one of the ways you can tell that a, a tree is an ash tree is because it has a very cool bark. The bark has deep furrows in it, but the furrows sort of come together to form a diamond pattern. And ash trees in this part of the country have a real enemy, and it's the emerald ash borer. The emerald ash borer has no real enemies of its own, and it lays its eggs in these little grooves in an ash tree only ash trees and the little larva digs into the bark of the ash tree and ends up making all of these what look like interesting patterns but as it makes those patterns it eats the little the part of the tree right in between the the bark and the inside part of the tree and that kills the ash tree so almost all of our ash trees in this part of the country are dying because of this one insect. And these trees that are down on the ground here either fell over when they died or they were dead and they needed to be cut down. So, all right. Thank you, Mr. Duffy. All right, so Tom and I are back to kind of finish off some questions. A lot of, we'll stick on the tree theme. A lot of questions regarding uh, trees here. Uh, Emmy from Daranowski asks how many different tr uh, types of trees uh, does the forest have at Sloper? We have no idea. We do have a bunch of different types of trees here at Camp Sloper though. And on our website, we have a tree identification hike. Uh, and if you want more information on that, you can certainly 
call uh, YMCA Camp Sloper and we can give you that. But um, how many trees are on that hike? Do you remember? Oh, there's gosh. 17, I believe. I believe. There's 17. 17 trees. Different, different types. types. Different types, so at we, least. Yeah, so we talked about the ash. We have a lot of cedars out here. We have pine trees. We have maple trees. We have oak trees. Um, that's just to name a few. But YMCA Camp Sloper has a ton of different types of trees. Go All ahead, right. Tom. Uh, switching gears a little bit. This one comes from Gavin from Thalberg. And he said, what other animals besides worms, birds, and deer do you have at camp? And that's a great question. Um, and I think to piggyback on someone else's question was, why didn't we see any here to, uh, the other day? Well, first of all, we're really loud. And most animals don't like loud, noisy, large creatures like ourselves to be near them because we think they think we're predators. Um, so you won't see a lot of these unless you're super quiet, you hang out for a long time. Maybe you'll catch a squirrel or two. But to get onto all the different types of animals we have and that we've seen, um, we've definitely seen plenty of fox. We know we get raccoons all the time. They like to dig through the garbage just because it's free food, you know. Um, different types of birds. You've got the American robin. You've got um, the swans in the pond. You've got all the geese that are around. You've got, um, I, know, I wish Coach Nick was here. He's, the, he's our bird expert. Um, yep. We go, we'll let Coach Nick jump in at some point, some other time, to talk about the different birds. Uh, yes, we've seen some bears out here. Um, very rarely, though. And they don't like to come around because there's obviously too many people. Um, other animals, turtles, we've got muskrats. We actually have, around our pond, we have a lot of uh, animal signs that you can see, that you can read about some of these animals, too. Like, there's a muskrat sign over on the west coast. Uh, I believe there's a fox sign over on the other side of the green trail near Sunset Point. And you can learn about all these different animals too. One of our favorite ones, and we, we actually named one, it was just for fun. We have a red-tailed hawk that likes to fly around. Mm -hmm. uh, we named him Anthony. I don't know why he's named Anthony, but someone said that the red-tailed hawk's name is Anthony. So he just hangs around a lot of times near yep. our library section, um, which is really cool. So we do have a lot of other animals here. You're not gonna see a lot of them all the time. And of course our favorite, the turtles. Yep. We have lots of turtles. Sloper There's a couple mascot. logs in the in the pond that they love to sunbathe on when it's warm outside, which is really cool. So that was a great question. Thank you, Gavin, for that one. Um, and then maybe we'll do maybe two more just. Yeah, so I'll go with one. Um, this question, I'm, tr I'm trying to find the name and hopefully I'll find it later, but I read it earlier and it was, why are some parts of the forest wet while some are less wet or drier? Um, and I would say, so all of our... The rain and the reason the forest is wet here comes from up on the mountain over that way. So we have a lot of channels and streams that go through. So as you can kind of see over on this side over here, it's there's a stream that goes all the way down to our pond um, and the water picks up there and goes down, okay? It's based on water erosion a little bit that you guys learned in the fall with us. Um, so the section that Tom and I are in, yes, it gets wet, but it is, a drier area because all the other water is diverted to another section of the forest to get to the pond. So that was Great. a good question, I thought. All right, I've got one more. Um, and this one's a good one. I, I really like this one because it's a, it's a thinker a little bit. And it comes from Ariana from Daranowski. She asked, how is, uh, is this forest a temperate forest ecosystem? And is it different than the, and, and I don't know how to pronounce this, I'm going to call it the Tega forest. Uh, type of forest. So really like the question was what type of forest is this? Now here in Connecticut and actually along the East Coast we are part of the temperate forest system which is which makes up a very very large area. There's parts of all the parts of the different parts of the world in China and Russia and different things like that all about where we are on earth where the temperate zone is. The if I'm not pronouncing it correctly the Tega forest system is actually a little farther north where they experience much longer winters and short summers. So here we got really good seasons. We got, you know, three or four months of winter, a couple months of spring, a bunch of months of summer, and a couple months of fall. So we've got a good variety. We're right in the middle, temperate forest system, lots of uh, seasonal trees and plants and things like that. So we are in the temperate forest system. This is, the sloper forest is just a really, really small part of that much bigger temperate forest system. So that was a great question as well. I have one more time. Sure. This was a, a fun one to read. It's, a, it's from our friend Eli at Oshana uh, Elementary School. And this is a question I'm going to ask you, Tom. It's like sure. trivia. Sure. Are clouds alive? 
Are clouds alive? That's yep. a great question. You got to think about what clouds are made of. They're made up of um, water, of course, because they, when they precipitate, they, they rain down. Um, I'm sure there's a few gases in there as well. I'm going to go with no. I'm saying no. No. And, and Mr. Duffy shaking his head no. He's saying no, too. Yes. Uh, clouds are not alive, but we appreciate them just that was the a, same. That was a fun question to have <laughs> in the forest. Um, so, yeah, we hope you guys enjoyed no. the forest study with... Oh, we got one more? One more. I think I got one oh, more. Oh, yes. i got to find out so, where Tom, if anybody has it. Yes. But. Tom will look, but the question was... Um, why are there still dead leaves? As you guys can see in the video, there's a ton of dead leaves out here from the trees. Obviously, the the we the trees fall in the fall time. Um, so how, why are they still here, and how have they not decayed yet? It's a great question. So for leaves to decay, it takes a long period of time. It takes more than just a couple of months, uh, which it's been from the, from the fall. It takes a long time. So as Tom is holding some things up here, so this this leaf here, that's probably been de trying to decay for a number of years. You see the holes in it? While you have a, tr a leaf like this one, which probably fell this year, okay? See how it's not as decayed as this one? So it takes some time. Um, and But that was a really interesting and, and great observation uh, as you guys were watching the forest video, I thought. Yeah, it cool. was great. Well, thank you guys so much for your forest ecosystem questions. We loved all of them. I wish we could get more to them, but otherwise this video might be four hours long. Yep. And I don't think we have that attention span. Like, I don't have that attention span. So we're going to get to our answer as many as we possibly can. But stay tuned. We're going to go to a different ecosystem and answer more questions from all of our science, fourth grade scientists from all of the different schools. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on the next one. Whatever you want. Hi, fourth grade scientists. It's Justin. You guys watched uh, the pond ecosystem video. This is your follow up and questions with myself and Too Tall Tom in just a second. Um, now, there were some great observers in this video, uh, and they, they saw me doing a couple of things. The first one, Ella from Kelly. She asked when I was scooping up some of our pond sample from the pond, she noticed that I threw something back in the pond before putting it in the bowl, which was a very good observation. Uh, I didn't think anyone would see that. Uh, it was what I threw back in. Whenever I do this science um, lesson with students, anytime I get a big leaf or a big stick, I tend to throw it back because that's not necessarily what we're looking for. We're looking for the smaller things that we showed you guys um, via the microscope on the iPad. So that's why I got rid of that one. So Ella, great job observing. That was, that was pretty funny to read that question. Um, the second question I got that I thought was pretty observant as well was at the end of the, of the, the, the experiment, do we put all the pond samples back into the pond? Uh, the answer is yes, right? Because we want to make sure we return um, whatever we disrupt in nature or the environment back to where it belongs, so we do. So I, after the experiment, we put it in a big kind of bucket and then we bring it back to the pond and dump it in there. So yes, we do return anything that we uh, took out of the pond back in. So I thought those were really uh, two great observations. The other one, there was a bunch of questions on how deep is the pond at YMCA Camp Sloper? How deep is the water? We, that question, just as I'm reading right now is uh, from, we got one from Connor, that's how, how deep is the pond. Eli mm -hmm. from Strong. Eli from Strong asked that question. Grace asked, uh, can you people swim in the pond? So there, there's a lot of questions on the pond and how deep it is and can you swim in it. So first, how deep? So the, our pond at YMCA Camp Sloper, probably at its deepest point is about eight to nine feet deep, really. That's it. Um, why is it only that deep? Great question. So obviously the, the way ponds are, they things grow from the bottom, right? And every year YMCA Camp Sloper, we try to remove that and we basically kind of kill the growth and push it down and it compacts over time to, for, to make like sediment in the pond, which is, makes it less deep, I guess. So that is, that's one reason. Uh, that's, so that's kind of the, the deepness question. The second one, 
uh, is can you swim in the pond? Yeah, we swim all the time in the pond in the summertime as long as there's a lifeguard on duty and you're in the swim area. Uh, so you can't just come here right now and go swimming. Uh, not even Too Tall Tom and myself can do that right now. We need a lifeguard. Uh, but yes, you can swim in the pond. Another question about the pond was, uh, why is, does the pond look, uh, it's not clear. Why is it not clear? Well, it looks a little bit dirty. Um, all ponds look that way, right? There's uh, obviously clear swimming pools where you can see the bottom, but most ponds look like how YMCA Camp Slopers look, where you can't see the bottom. Why? Because there's dirt and it really, we get a lot of runoff from the mountain that goes into the pond and that's really what ponds look like. So that was a really obser uh, great observation um, and uh, it was a great question. So I, we appreciated that question. So there was also other questions about our insects and animals and fish and uh, that live in the pond that Two Tall Tom's gonna come in here and touch upon a little bit. Sure, here I come, come in. All right, um, so yeah, just like Justin said, we have a lot of questions about what else is in the pond besides just those little guys that we showed you in the video. Um, someone like, where is he there? Uh, right at the top somewhere on my, on my page. Um, Noah from Strawn, he said, are there fish in the lake? And fun fact, actually, I'm gonna have Justin go move the camera because right behind me is a fun, cool poster of fish of Connecticut. Now, not all of these fish are in Sloper Pond, but there are a bunch in there that we see very often. A few of which would be the smallmouth bass. Mm -hmm. People catch those all the time when they go fishing, as well as the sunfish are the two most popular fish that we have in our pond. But there are others, and I've heard of other people catching some of these fish. We actually might have saw a brown bullhead um, that was caught one day. We got a picture from somebody, which was really cool. So these are a lot that you can see throughout Connecticut. In Sloper Pond, it's only some of them are there. Yep. Now, if you move over to this poster over here, we got a lot of visuals in this one. We do. Uh, people are asking about all the different types of animals and reptiles and amphibians that we might have in the pond as well. There are a lot of different anim uh, amphibians and reptiles in this picture. We do have some here that are very common. Um, a lot of, we do have a lot of turtles that yep. like to hang out. Uh, we do have a lot of frogs. We do occasionally find some salamanders or newts that come around. I know even in our forest ecosystem, I found a blue spotted salamander once and was able to hold it in my hand, which is pretty cool. Um, yes, occasionally we get some of these guys you may, may or not like. Um, some of, most of them are live on, on dry land and live towards the mountainside, but we do occasionally see them by the water because they like water too. And of course, a few snapping turtles here and there that we move, and move aside as well. So we do have lots of different creatures that do call the pond home outside of just the little guys that we showed you as well. Um, another question that was asked that we can touch upon, I'm trying if I can remember it, um, so a big one where you saw in the video when we actually found the dragonflies and the damselflies. I believe this question was from Chase about and, and Dia from Strong. Do the damselflies actually fly? So, fun fact: those little creatures that you find, the damselflies and the and the dragonflies, start their life in the water. When they grow up, months later, that's when they actually emerge from the water. And yes, they do actually fly away. And when they're ready at the end of the season, they actually reproduce and drop all of their eggs into the water. And then that's where they start to cultivate and they get a little bit bigger. And once the time comes and they're ready to hatch, that's when they break free. And then they go out and they're moving around in the water again, starting the whole cycle over again. So yes, when you see a dragonfly, they actually started underwater in the beginning of their life, which is pretty cool. Um, Ella from Strong also said, how many swans live at Camp Sloper? And typically, that's a great question, we only saw one in our video, the other one was hiding, okay? There are typically only two swans that are kind of call Sloper their home. Reason being is that swans are very territorial, which means that once they have their space, it's theirs. They don't like anybody else to share it. That's not me, humans, and things like that. But we do occasionally see the swans start to uh, chase the geese that are around. So the swans really don't like the geese and you'll see them flapping and, and chasing, playing tag, we'll call it, and try to get them to go to a different pond because this is the swan's territory. Mostly because they are also ready to reproduce and they have their swan nest and they don't want anybody going near their swan's nest or any of their babies. So they're very protective and territorial of their space. I'm gonna see if I can find one more real quick. 
or if anybody else wants to shout out a question from the crowd that they saw that was really good. There were a couple questions about this water level. The water level, sure. So we did. We mentioned that in the video. Oh, yeah, yeah. We mentioned that in the video about what was the high. Did you think that the water level was high or low? In that video, it was very high because we've gotten a ton of rain in this late winter, early spring recently, which all comes from the top of the mountain screaming down in. It just rains directly in as well. So right now, the water is very high, but throughout the whole year, the water level changes. Uh, heights. So in the summertime we've had before where the water level has receded almost 10 feet but where, where we were standing collecting the sample you could actually walk out an extra 5 feet on dry land and you're practically in the pond. Versus sometimes we've seen it where it's actually overflowing and it's up above where we were standing which means we had a really rainy season. So our pond fluctuates. It changes all the time depending on if we got a lot rain, maybe we had a lot of snow in the winter time, or we're in a drought and we don't have a lot of water around, so we have this pond actually shrinks a little bit, which is a pretty good question. That was a great question, Mr. Duffy. Thanks for sharing that one again. Um, well, thank you guys so much. I know we didn't get to all the questions. I wish we could, but thank you for tuning into our pond ecosystem video. Thanks for all the questions that you guys sent in, all the schools, all the kids. We got one more workshop to show you all the questions that we got. And then if you have any more questions, you can always just come out and visit us and we'll be happy to ask you or answer your questions. Right. Hello, fourth grade scientists, and welcome back to our wetlands. We're in the middle of the wetlands right now. Um, if you remember, we saw a lot of different things out here. I know a lot of people are asking lots of questions about some of the things that they saw in the video, and we're definitely going to answer a bunch of them right now. First one we're going to tackle is going to be what's behind me. A lot of people commented on why is there an, another pond in the wetlands, and why is it there? I, don't, I can't remember if I, I'll find some the names in there in a second. But the reason why there's another pond in there is because of the way the land is in this area. So the pond, the R Sloper Pond, is at a higher elevation. This one is a little lower, but what you can't see over on the right side, when you probably hear all the cars going by, is where the road is. And that road is a little higher than where this pond is, which means that the water really doesn't have anywhere else to go. So it's either got to sink into the ground or evaporate to go somewhere else. So seasonally, like I said, mentioned before, this is a seasonal wetland, this water, just like the pond itself, will recede, it'll get smaller, and sometimes it'll fill up more if there's more rain that comes down from the pond. So right now it's super full. This yep. is really high water, lots of stuff in, the, in and around the pond. So that's the answer to that question right there. Um, a lot of people very curious about our green friends all over the wetlands right now, the skunk cabbage. This guy right here is enormous, by the way. This one right here. Yep. Um, so we're going to answer a couple of questions about the skunk cabbage. First and foremost, why is it called skunk cabbage? The only and the biggest and the main reason why it's called skunk cabbage is because they smell. They smell pretty bad. Uh, and a fun fact about skunk cabbage is that if you injure it, if it gets ripped or broken or starts to die a little bit, it actually smells even worse. So, just like a real skunk, I would stay away from these guys a little bit. They probably smell a little bit. No need to touch them or anything like that or break them apart because you'll make it smell a lot worse. Um, why are the skunk cabbage here? That was another question that was mentioned. Um, and the reason why they're here, one, is because this type of plant has really adapted well to living in the wetlands where they love the water. They love all of the, the type of soil that it lives in. And there's tons of sunshine everywhere because the trees aren't blocking the ground from getting hit by sunlight. So it's like an ideal place to grow. And a lot of different other types of plants grow here too, specifically small ferns and things like that. So skunk cabbage thrive. They do really well in wetland settings because there's tons of water lots of sunlight and great soil to grow in. So that was a great question from a lot of you. There was like seven, eight, nine, 20 people that asked that, that question. So you guys are all thinking the same way, which is great, great observers. Um, 
What else? Oh, there was one about um, about the animals that live here. I, again, I can't I can't read fast enough to find all the names and everything like that. Um, but we talked about in the forest. There's a lot of different types of animals, mostly big mammals and things like that. Um, down here in the wetlands, we mentioned that there's a lot of smaller animals, the little guys, because this is a great place for animals to start their life and grow. So we have a lot of the smaller birds. Um, sometimes we see chipmunks running around in, in here. Um, lots of amphibians. I know there's a lot of tadpoles in this water, like this, the frogs start in the tadpole stage and then they grow up. And when they need bigger and better food, that's when they migrate towards the big pond and that's where they go over there too. So you're going to see a lot of, of our animal creatures in their, their young stages here. But again, if you're loud, like I'm being right now, or if you're kind of in the area stomping around and running around, you might not see a lot of these things because they're afraid of you. They don't want to get eaten by you, even if you're not one of those people. Now, another question, I'm going to bring Justin in for this yep. one because I know this question, I'm going, to, I'm going to call someone out because this one's pretty good. I like this one. Um, Is it the sinkhole, Tom? It's the sinkhole one. Uh, there's a lot of sinkhole questions. That's great because we're focused our, on the sinkhole. That's here. one of our key features. And the the questions were as follows: They were, um, can how deep is the sinkhole? Um, is there only one sinkhole? And then the last one, which I thought was super good and kind of funny, from Jenna from Strong. She said, "Can the sinkhole swallow people whole?" We're gonna test that out right now. Not by Justin jumping here we in, go. but there's a uh, there's a stick in there that I'm gonna grab that I used in the video before. Now I remember, in the video I said I was about six feet four inches, and I tested out, this is the actual stick that I use, and I remember it, because I put it in, and we determined that the stick was only in there about three feet. Well, it, it wasn't hitting the bottom. So we're gonna pull this out. Yikes. Now, I'm six feet, four inches. Justin is... I'm five foot, four and a half inches. He's about a foot shorter than me. Yep. This stick is taller than Justin, and the water level goes to about two or three inches before the end of the stick, which means if I put my finger over to the top of Justin's head, you'd see a couple of his hair sticking out of the water. So to answer your question, Jenna, yes. Yes, it would swallow me whole, but not too tall top. The worst part of it is at the bottom of this stick is all that muck. That, oh, there it goes. Oh, there's another piece. Oh, there's more. It stinks. Oh, man, put it back in. That will probably swallow your shoes. You'll get stuck in there, and it will not be easy to get out. So, no, we don't recommend trying out your, on your own if the sinkhole will swallow you up. Not recommended at all. No. Oh man, it really does stink. That and the skunk cabbage making this a tough job. I won't push it all the way in. I gotta wash my hands later. Yep. But, a lot of great questions. John, do you have any others? Justin, you remember any other questions that were out there? No, I think we're good. We did the skunk cabbage, we did the sinkhole question. Apparently, I'm getting swallowed up by the sinkhole at yeah, some point. Yeah, you gotta point, watch out for those but, sinkholes. They'll jump out and get you. But no, this was very fun, uh, and we hope that all our fourth grade scientists enjoyed it. Right, Tom? Absolutely. Thank you yep. guys for tuning in, watching with us. And we'll we hope to see you soon, and thank you so much for tuning in. You guys are awesome. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, guys. Um.